Welcome back to another episode of George in the Jungle, presented by Remington Tavern. Remington Tavern can be found at 8892 Glendale Milford Road, 45140, where they have their daily happy hour from 3 to 7 p.m., $5 bourbon whiskey Wednesdays, bottle cap bonanza Thursdays from 7 to 9. You can check them out on Instagram at Remy Tav Cincy. That's R-E-M-I. T-A-V, Cincy with a Y, or you can follow them on Facebook. But with that said, George. Yes, sir. How was your week? Not too bad. The The weather's finally, I think it's, we're, we're done with sub 60. I, I think it's, it's fair to say. Um, so uh, today I think it hit 85. Here. No, I'm really disappointed I didn't get on a golf course today. That was just a fail, a massive fail. Well, that, but that's, that's my not, fault. Nobody that's else. A problem. Yeah, that, that's a you problem. It's a total you problem. I did get I, in I a got, good workout this morning. That's good. Almost threw up. Oh. <laughs> One of those. Well, you went hard. Went real hard. Doesn't take much for me. Um, but speaking of going hard, it seems that the men's basketball staff has been going hard this portal season, as you now have two new Bearcats in, uh, Bradley's Connor Hickman coming in at the combo guard spot and Arnton page transferring in from USC, a guy that this staff was heavily involved in his recruitment out of high school uh, before he followed his AAU teammate, Isaiah Collier to USC, but he's, he's, I don't even think he had to take an official visit for this one. I think he just knew what he had gone through the first go round and a year later he's, he's here. Yeah. Um, and, and that was good for the Bearcats to have that kind of relationship with him. And, you know, tell you what, if you want me to do you a big favor, I'll get you off the hook about being Mr. Negative on Connor Hickman. <laughs> and I'll say I'm afraid that Arrington Page might be the next Jermaine Lawrence. Would that get you off oh, the hook? Oh, no. I don't know that that helps. I think that makes – that puts us in the I same boat, it. George. <laughs> no, i got to tell you – um, and obviously, we were familiar with him last year through the whole recruiting process and what he was like. And you go back and look at some of that tape, and you get really excited about how well this dude moves, Paige, and just, you know, his his ball skills and, and apparently shoots it very well. Um, you know, did not have a great year as a freshman at USC, but he played, what, like 11 minutes a game or something like that. Didn't get a lot something of PT. Like um, but look. This kid's going to fit right in here, I think. Um, I'm not sure it gets him the, the low-scoring presence that I, I was hoping they would get. Um, I hope they don't have to be playing down at the block all the time. I hope they have enough scoring options if that's not something they have to have. I still worry a little bit about that inside scoring, but hopefully he can take some of that load. And, and then you have the two freshmen coming in that have some size in, in Betsy McKinley. So um, I love this. I mean, I, I you know, I, I love seeing him come aboard, and, and I wish he'd done it last year. So I had it, already had a year in this system, but he didn't. Um, I, I just see this as a great pickup for UC, and it's been a darn good week for UC. 10.7 minutes per game to your point. So, yeah, you were just about spot on with that 11. Um, he is a 49.2% field goal shooter. 31.3% three-point shooter. He did take some threes. He, I believe he averaged um, like 0.3 made per game in the 27 games that he played. And I think it was uh, like 0.6 or 0.7 uh, attempted. Um, I guess that that that, mat, that doesn't math correctly. Maybe it was higher than that. Maybe it was closer to one per game it was taken. Decent for a guy that size. 31.3 um, yeah. from three. Yeah. And yeah. his his – he can be a bit of a threat there, and he's only going to get better. His free throw percentage fits right in as a Bearcat, 53.1% from the line. So, 
Um, but he, he did average uh, two rebounds, uh, about a half an assist, 0.3 blocks, 0.3 steals. Um, so so we'll see. Three yeah, point one. stats and, and the, you know, I don't know what the circumstances were in those games. And did I watch USC this year? Not really. Um, but you look at that tape and you look at the stuff he was doing and, and how he was able to move. Um, how he was able to handle the ball, how fluid he was. Um, that That's what excites me. For a man that big, uh, he moves really, really well. Uh, so I, I just I, – I was tickled when I heard that pickup. And I just – you know, you've got him and Aziz down low now. you got the two freshmen coming in. And then already with what UCS coming back. Um, and then you add to it. Um, Connor Hickman coming in and, and helping from the perimeter and, and certainly was able to shoot the ball at a pretty uh, good clip this past season uh, from three points, from three point well, heck all over. I mean, I went back. I'm such a geek sometimes. Uh, I went back <laughs> to look. Well, you know, I went back on ESPN Plus and watched all his plays in that game against Bradley with, with UC and the NIT. And, and this kid is a player. I mean, he didn't just – stand outside and look to shoot. In fact, one time he went down low. Uh, he, he took the ball inside against disease and he spun him around like a top in there and then laid it in with his left hand. Um, you know, he, he's got some moves. He can go inside. He can shoot from outside. I just think he's a solid player. And it was funny. I was looking at that game and I don't, I think Newman was in the game and he hits a three when, when Skillings went under a screen because Dan was on him. Then he caught a ball out top and beat Dan inside, laid it in. Well, then Newman was on him. And then he, he made a fairly well-guarded three right after that when Newman was on him. But um, that says something about that kid when, when Wes Miller is going to say, you know what, I got to put my best defender on him for a while to cool him off. And, and that's what Wes did. Um, you know, is is he an All American? No, but I think he's a pretty darn solid player. It gives you a lot of confidence in either one of those guard spots. I think, um, you know, wherever you see he's going to need it. Yeah, uh, he he was one sixty four of three fifty one from the field, uh, seventy four of one eighty four from three. So less than half of his shots, I guess, um, at least the made ones. Um, yeah, less than half. Uh, I would say I was surprised. Okay, what I heard about him uh, coming into that game, and then I was at the game and watching him, and I was surprised at his versatility on offense. I thought it was more of a spot-up shooter, that kind of thing, and that wasn't it. Um, and and he's, uh, you know, they, they mentioned in the game, I mean, the dude bench press is like 315 or something, so that tells me. He's been in the weight room working. He's a hard worker. Um, and that that's the vibe he gave off in that game that I watched. And, you know, I, I have no reason to believe that's not him night in and night out. So is he spectacular? Is he going to knock the socks off all the recruiting services? No, but I think he fits very well what Wes and the staff were looking for. So, so that, that, makes me say two thumbs up for that signing. I know you took some grief last night saying, well, what'd you say? Should I not it's, even repeat this? No, it's it's fine. I'm going to double down on it anyway. It's I'm cautiously optimistic uh, because it, it the signing doesn't really move the needle for me. And I think that's an okay thing that it doesn't move the needle for you. I'm not, I'm not pissing and moaning about it. I'm not angry about it. I'm not, you know what I mean? Like I have to bring it up. It's that's fine. I, I'm not mad about it. I'm I'm also not going to be, you know, jumping to to a, a mountaintop to shout about the the staff got Connor Hickman. I I do hope that the guy I I, I meant to make this joke last night, but I'll make it here. Uh, I do hope the guy gets an NIL deal with Gillette because I'm not sure what that is above his lip. But <laughs> that said, um, <laughs> I I I agree with you. I, I think he does fit a role here. Um, I think that if things don't go in the NIT the way that they went, and thank goodness they actually played in the NIT because I, I, we got to see Jizzle on fire. Right. Um, 
and, and we got to see some things that we may not have seen otherwise. Um, and even in, even if you go in back into the, uh, the big 12 tournament run for Cincinnati, um, if things don't go to where you have guys shooting in, in right, where you have guys scoring 20 plus points in a game, finally, for the first time, I think all season, uh, I, I think that you're probably going into portal season with a completely different mindset than you did in, as opposed to trying to bring somebody in to build around instead you're able to build around your core because they showed that they finally turned a page and they were able to start doing something so now you're able to add complementary pieces instead of finding an alpha because i think you probably have an alpha in whether whether in any given night it's Simos Jizzle or Dan Skillings right. i think those are your three guys that you can lean into as opposed to having to go out and find a guy like a Landers Nolly. Yeah, and, and just as important for the staff, you know, or, or for the the kids to learn that is the staff to learn that. And that's what that NIT did. Um, and I think the staff had a pretty good idea, but, you know, it's one thing to think it, but you got to go out and do it. And, and they did it in those games. Um, I wish they could have done it a little more in that Indiana State game, but that was just a hell of a game. Indiana State was on fire. Um, UC put up what 81 and still lost. I mean, give me a break. Um, that, that was a crazy game. I still think UC could have pulled that out at the end. Um, but all that being said, I, I, I like the signing. I, I like the kid. I like what I saw in that game. And, you know, it, it, look, it wasn't like UC was the only one after him either. Indiana just had him in for a visit over the weekend and would have loved to have had him. And inked him, and not that Indiana's the be all the end all. In fact, they're the third or fifth, fourth best team in the state of Indiana right now. When you look at Purdue, Indiana State, maybe Purdue, Fort Wayne, or Ball State, maybe well, they Oakley. just they just brought in that center uh, Ballo today. Uh, so I, I think that that improves them tremendously. But right. I, I see what you're saying. But but it, but the but the kid is is a uh, is a he, he's an entity that more than UC wanted. It wasn't just like, you know, right. They just took a guy that fell in their lap. There were other people going after him. And, and then you go to uh page today. I mean, I don't know. There, there's a lot of programs would like to have a, a sophomore to be that has his pedigree and, and, and has his skills to, to work with for two or three years. And so, um, I give Wes and his staff two thumbs up. And, and what I really like about it is just the the trajectory they're on. It's going up and up and up with each year and each step. And a lot of this speaks to that staff and Wes Miller and that kids do want to be here. And just what? Tonight, another one said he wants to be here next year. Yeah. Uh, you you had Jizzle James who actually finally announced I'm back uh, or let's run it back or whatever it was that he said on Instagram. Um, but, but yes, to your point, uh, he's, he's coming back. So the only one at this point that we haven't heard from uh, that's on the roster is CJ Frederick. Uh, oh, here's, here's. Hi. Hi hey dad. dad. Uh, I, I will just say this on Jizzle. If he's not your favorite player yet, he should be. <laughs> well, my he's... understanding, I, I can't get into specifics, but my understanding is a couple very big brand name programs made a serious run at him with uh, Will Wade strong ass offers, and he chose to stay in Cincinnati. Oh, good. And that definitely speaks to the culture that Wes has built here, in my opinion. I think. It's been obvious to me that kids have been more willing to stay here than, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's hard to judge against previous regimes because this portal's gotten so crazy. But if you look around at some of the teams, and some of the teams that had deep runs in the NCAA tournament are having trouble hanging on to their own. They're yeah. losing key players. So uh, it just I, I've been on, you know, the phone for two days now. It's been insanity. 
dealing with with everything as it happens and it's about to happen and it might happen and it's not happening and then uh it's gonna happen and it actually happens in seven seconds and by the time i oh. called keegan i got the call that hickman was gonna commit and by the time i called keegan it was already on twitter or instagram or whatever yeah, no, it's I, I'm. <laughs> I, I was about to tell you I really miss those days where I was in the middle of that stuff, but it was nothing like it is now. With no, this crazy, you know, I, I mean, crazy. you know, there were there was free agency in baseball and and in, in NFL and that stuff, but what you guys are dealing with are in the middle of this and having to report this stuff and try to stay up with it. I don't envy one bit because it is, <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, I was checking stuff today, right? And I go to the grocery store at like, I don't know, 2.30. I come out at 3.30 and someone calls me, oh, yeah, you know, what do you think about Paige, huh? What? What happened? It's like it just happens instantaneously. Yep. Um, so there's still one scholarship open as things currently stand. Who knows what could potentially develop? I mean, last last year you had some late entrance, even after we thought the dust had settled into the portal. So, who knows what will happen over the course of the next week or whatever? Uh, but well, here's what I like about it: it it's kind of like, and, and we'll we'll probably get to the Bengals at some point. But it's kind of like they are going into the draft. BPA. Quite honestly, they can just sit back and see what pops, what doesn't. Who's there? Who fits them? If some superstar somehow lands in there, fine. It, it almost doesn't matter the position at this point. Um, I, I would like to have a little more inside scoring. Um, I don't know what Wes thinks about that and, and where they're at. Um, just personally, I would. But you're at a point where you take the best player available. And if he's there, yeah. fine. And if not, okay. Yeah, I don't know that you necessarily need any position right now as, as the things currently stand because, I mean, we kind of went over this a little bit, but you got Jizzle Day Day at the one. You've got uh, Hickman and C.J. Frederick at the two. Um, you've got, what, Dan and Ravon at the three. You've got Seamoss right. and the Tylers uh, yeah. at the four. And then you've got uh, Aziz and – and Paige at the five, and uh, oh, Josh Reed at the four as well. Um, so I don't know. I don't know where else you necessarily need anything. You don't have to is, reach for anything, which is a good thing, right? That's you can a very good thing. That's find, that's find a guy that be. find a guy that fits your culture, fits what it is that your program is doing and building on. Whether it's a one one and done. Um, you know, with a guy with one year of eligibility left, whether it's a guy with two, three years left, you've got some some flexibility. Um, I I would probably I'm with you. I, I think I'd probably like to see them go with a big of some sort, because um, if either Aziz or Page go down, now you're kind of yeah. relying on on a freshman. Uh, right. Whether it be probably probably at the five, you're probably leaning into um, McKinley. Right. Um, so, so I'm probably leaning towards the five spot. Um, but as we found out in the tournament, you also can't have enough guys at the point. So, yeah. Um, and, and, and it's, it's crazy. I mean, you know, you've seen how the NBA game has evolved and is so much different where you don't have to have that so-called big planted down low and college basketball's definitely gotten there. And, and so, that, that's why I feel like they do have a lot of flexibility here. But, yeah, given my druthers, give me an inside score yet to go. But I, I just – I kind of love where they're positioned right now. I agree. Um, outside of that, I don't know that there's necessarily too much more on that side of the ball. Um, women's – obviously, there's some things going on around the uh, women's hoops – uh, until some things actually start popping off, I don't know that I'm. I, I don't know that I'm well versed enough to actually have those conversations. Um, no, I know. I mean, I've, I've you know, we've seen and heard some things. Um, I've heard some things, 
but what I heard, I don't think has come to fruition yet. I was, I, I was heard as early as tomorrow something could be announced that would be a, a big deal for the women's team, but I haven't seen any anything saying that's going to happen, so I, I, I'm, I'm not believing it just yet. But for uh, UC to be in the conversation on a couple of those, one in the portal and, and, uh, and you know, the D. Alexander from Purcell Marion, I mean, that's a top five, five player in the country. And that, that's a program changer. And, you know, let's put it this way. Um, you know, they got a heck of a program over there. and But the way, you know, when she was a freshman and the way she played, it was almost like a Pied Piper situation where all these other players jumped on board uh, and they're winning state championships. Boy, that would be something. That would be a big deal if she committed to UC. Huge. Deal. Yeah. And so, you know, my understanding is she's kind of a, a UC fan. So it'd be really cool if that happened. That would be really cool. There's so cool. many other factors involved, and we know what those are when you're talking NIL and all that. But, you know, give me a kid that loves their hometown, and I, I, I'm, I'm all in. It's really cool to see what uh, Katrina and company are, are building over there. And I think that after this offseason, it seems that it's and definitely true. really well with what they had last year. So, you know, there's reason to believe that, that she can get this thing going. Yeah, it seems that that whole program over there is, is certainly trending up. So good to see uh, in that regard. Uh, switching gears to football. Uh, football has had some guys entering the portal. They've had some guys um, leave, leaving the program, but spring football was on Saturday. Uh, before we get to the portal talk, were you able to make it on Saturday? I made it. Okay. Uh, I had some people with me, so I didn't text you guys to go down on the field because I think it would have been rude. Um, so, so I hung out upstairs. I didn't see you guys. Were you on the field? I was on the field the whole time. I, under this headband, there's some pretty bad sunburn. Which, which, which side? Were you on the press box side? I, I ran around. Um, I, I was you. moving around. Um, I should have texted you and had you come over, but I was just – Yeah. I was just – I would come up. I, was, I bought a bag of those Bearcat barbecue chips, and yeah, I had some, some sodas and – just kind of sat in my seats and, and watched the proceedings. And, um, yeah, it was entertaining. I got some, you know, what the heck did I – oh, I'll tell you. So I'll just start with this. Early in, early in the game when they got into the scrimmage portion and all that, um, you know, and all this stuff was made of the receiving core last year and not getting open – I felt like they weren't getting open early in this thing. Yeah. I felt like too many times the quarterback didn't matter who it was. Didn't matter if it was if it was Sorsby, Lichtenberg, Jones, didn't matter. They would look and then kind of have to scramble to, you know, take off on runs and stuff. But yeah. as the as the, and and you're like, okay, well, maybe the DBs are better this year. Maybe they are. I don't know. You don't know how to take these things when it's your own team against your own team and your own guys. Um, but they did get open a little bit later and some throws were made. And, um, I, I, you know, it, it, like I said, it's just tough to really judge where they are, but I can tell you this, I did like what I saw out of Soresby for the most part. Um, and I thought as it went on, I don't know what happened in that one play though, that little turnover at the goal line, they had four tight ends yeah. come. It was down in in the the uh, well. It's not even the open end anymore, but it's like the Bearcat Lair end, the north the north end zone. Yes, the north end zone. What the hell happened on that play? Do you know? I don't. Um, like it looked like the ball just squirted out, and <laughs> it was a turnover. I don't know what happened on that, but other than that play, um, you know, I thought Soresby did really well. I thought the designed runs. He looked the part. Um, he, he definitely made some nice throws, and he had one he dropped in the bucket over the top that could have been caught. Um, 
and I forget who that was that, that was thrown to, but uh, I feel really good where they're at there. I feel really good where they're there. And then, okay. you know, Lichtenberg, we saw him some last year. I think, you know, he is what he is, and 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 he's he's okay. He knows what he's doing. Um, Jones looked really good for a freshman playing his first time, a kid who should be graduating this month from high school or next month. Um, but he did have a couple bad throws. One should have been picked. He missed an open receiver, overshot him, and it hit a dude in the chest, and he didn't hang on for the pick. I think his family was sitting a section over from me because they were all fired up about that and bummed at the same time. And then, sure. uh, then the other one he threw was a pick. I guess he was trying to throw it out of bounds, but he threw it inbounds because he was rolling out to yep. his right by the sideline and was just yep. trying to get rid of it. Coach First, addressed that one. Mistakes. They're going to make those mistakes. And Coach I, addressed that one in the presser. Uh, he said that after the play, he came over and, and they had to talk about, if you're going to throw it out, you have to make sure you get it out. You can't you, – if yeah. you're going to throw it away, throw it all the way away. You can't you can't just half-ass throw, throw it away. My yeah, words, not coach. That was. Co coach doesn't cuss, so those, those are my That's words. That's totally what that was. But um, you know, he 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 appears to be on pad. I was, I mean, that dude's put together. He's a big kid. I mean, six one or whatever. But my God, he could play. Uh, he could play safety or linebacker the way he looks. Um, and then a couple other of those freshmen, um, Sanks on the defensive side, and and. And Kale Wordburn on uh, the the wide receiver, um, true freshman who actually and he caught a ball in the end zone, um, fairly tough catch, good throw by Soresby, but that was surprising to see like true freshman who just came in at the uh, beginning of the semester, and they're out there playing like this, um, and I, I thought and. and you know, Keegan had given these updates throughout the spring practice notes about Manny Kobe, but my God, did he look good? Was, was Am I crazy? That dude maximized a lot of runs. Yeah, uh, that was, I guess, uh, I think almost every running back scored that, that wasn't named Corey Kiner. Corey, Corey set out. Um, yeah, yeah, he was staying on the sidelines, actually, on the side I was on the entire time, I believe. Um. Which makes sense. I think the offense stayed on one side. Oh, well, you, you know what that kid does, what right. he can do. And Satterfield talked about it afterwards about, you know, it, it, look, they're running backs. They get the absolute hell beat out of them. During sure. The they don't need to be taking more beatings. And, and Kiner, last year, he took a lot of hits because he was, you know, doing a lot of running between the tackles and, 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 getting beat up a lot, and there's no sense in exposing him to that. You know what you got. You know you got a stud. You just keep him healthy, and and that's a smart thing for the coaching staff to do. But you got to see plenty run out of uh, Evan Pryor, out of Manny Kobe, out of Chance he Williams. Yeah, I was – Chance Williams. Yep. There, there was nothing wrong. I mean, it was funny to see, uh, you know – how how little a couple of the guys look though. Um, mm -hmm. You know what I mean. And and when yes. I say little, I'm talking about short and stature. You know, it's uh, it, it's reminiscent reminiscent of uh, the the running back from uh, the Eagle, the Eagles and the Chargers back in the day. Um, the the where he was just so small compared to everybody else. Yeah. Um, I, well, and that yes. kid that played for Kansas State, that's with the Cowboys now, too. And, and he's tough as hell. Yeah. That's another he's one. Deuce Vaughn. It's, it's, you know, it's uh, – and you can get away with it at, the, at those positions. You really can. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, trust me, I'm not knocking them. I was just kind – but they were quick. They were fast. They're what you want out of guys like that. Um so yeah, and it was good to see Royer out there running around, and and Joey Belgian out there running around, and um, you know, it, but what's it going to be? I don't know till they tee it up for real. You just, you know, I just, I know this. You look at the guys that 
left here since that spring game are probably guys that know they're not going to get a lot of whiffs of the field this fall. I feel like since the end of last season, they've done a lot of house cleaning on this roster. Mm -hmm. And some of it was on the field stuff. Some of it was off the field stuff, but it was stuff that needed to be done. And at least uh, we'll, we'll see what the result is, but the effort is being made to revamp this roster and make it be what it was a few years ago where, you know, you had all those NFL draft picks and stuff and, and you're looking to upgrade the talent. And obviously, um, based on last year, that needs to happen. Now, we'll see what the coaches can do if they get said talent. Um, that's yet to be seen because they certainly didn't prove anything last year with what we saw. So so we will see. But they're, they seem to be committed to getting this thing right. Um, I hope like hell they do, but uh, it, it was a lot of fun to see those guys out there again and just get a look at these guys in a semi-real game situation. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I'll go right back to the first thing I said, and I, you know, did, did Soresby light the world on fire? Maybe not, but I, he looked like a, a – Pretty damn good quarterback in the making to me. Did you get a chance to watch the pressers? I watched. I watched Satterfield, Soresby, Lichtenberg, Dingle. I think those are the four I saw. Okay, uh, I, I asked that because I'm I'm curious what your thoughts were on the fact that they they were running these these pods, and yeah, uh, I, I so heard. So you never were actually watching the ones versus the ones or the ones versus right. the twos or the twos right. versus the threes or any of the combination they're about. Uh, so you essentially had the, uh, you know, a group, one pod would be a group of guys at a position group, like the offensive line or the receivers or whatever the case may be. Um, but in that regard, I, I think it's, you know, you were talking very early on in this segment about how you weren't sure what guys weren't being open and you weren't sure if that meant the DBs were better or if that meant that you, you know, what you weren't sure what that quite meant. But that who knows what pod you had out there. And, and you also were missing um, so you were missing some guys on the defensive side um, in Kalen Carroll and Jordan Young. Uh, you were missing some guys on the offensive side in Xavier Henderson and Tony Johnson. So, I mean, there's. All sorts of factors that can go into or at least a couple of linemen. Right? Yeah, Can Kendra was out. Um, yeah. Dartanian Tinsley was out. Uh, so yeah, you're you're missing guys here, there, and everywhere. Corey Kiner not playing. Um, all all sorts of different situations there. So I just wanted to point that out in through this conversation. You know what, what's interesting about that? And it's like weird. I don't know how the coaches came up with this and all that. But if you look at it this way. So these players don't know if they're a one or a two or a three or they're not sure. And that means I got to keep playing my butt off. I got to keep competing right. and I'm going to have to show up for camp in August or end of July. And I'm going to have to be in tip top shape if I want to get my butt on that field. And so I never thought about it till after that game. And they were talking about that pod thing. And I'm just running through these like, why and, da, 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 and you know he explained some of it but my god if you're a kid in that position and you're like i don't know where i stand even if i was on the field a lot last year i'm still kind of you know you you know you gotta you gotta be on top of your game and this could be uh it could be a genius move by the staff actually to motivate these guys to because no one knows where they stand for sure i mean i, I think some of them probably know they're going to be in the too deep, but a lot of them don't. And I think some of them probably were told you're not going to be in the too deep. And that's why we've seen, you know, since the end of the spring game, some names jump into that portal because they're probably not going to uh, get the playing time they expected when they were recruited by UC. And then there's some, you know, uh, Shepard and Carter were two of the names that, you know, when when UC got them as recruits, that was 
kind of a neat deal, a big deal, and and uh, guys that were well thought of. And God, you just never know; it doesn't always translate. And so, I think the staff has an idea, and I think some of the players probably don't know exactly where they stand. But the ones that aren't good enough, I think they were probably told. Yeah, um, it'll be interesting to see what they get out of the portal. Uh, I would love to see some guys at it, especially on defense. It seems that most of the names that I've seen entering the portal have been guys on defense. Um, but even with the guys that they had sitting out, uh, I think that we, we talked about this a little last night. Um, I know what, what position groups I think were thin, but what position groups do you are, are you wanting to see them add in? Oh, mercy sakes. Well, anything, honest to God, pretty much anything on defense. Pretty just much. What I saw last year. I sure. mean, seriously. That's fair. You've got a player on defense that you think it can that, that can start. And really, offensively, you feel like, I mean, you'll always take depth at, at offensive line, but um, – I'm still not sure on 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 tight end, but I'm not that worried about it. But I mean, do we know about wide receiver? So I would say for me, it's it's receiver. Uh, you always take anything you can get in either side of the trenches. Right. Um, corner. But yeah, would, wide receiver is one that's. I mean, running back. I think they're rich. Yeah, uh, corner corner continues to be a position group that I think is thin. Um, so I, I think that's probably where, where I'm at. I think we're on the same page, essentially. Yeah, I mean, I just I, – I was all fired up, though, when they ran those four tight ends out there for that play. <laughs> it, blew, it blew up in the test tube. <laughs> Goodness. It, it sucked. It was probably the worst play in the game. Oh, God. That's how well, it goes sometimes. You never – that's – but the guy with me, we're like four tight ends, and uh, we're laughing. We're like, this ought to be good. That happened. We're like, I bet they don't run that again. I still don't know what the hell happened. <laughs> um, switching gears completely, uh, the Cincinnati Reds. Since the last time we talked, they played. Uh, they've they've played five games since our last conversation. Uh, most recently. It didn't fare so well. They're, they're just starting. They're over on, on the West Coast playing Seattle. Uh, last night, they did not fare so well against Seattle, losing 9-3. Uh, but that was coming right after a three-game sweep of the Chicago White Sox, where they scored 27 runs compared to the White Sox, five. Um, and then, of the course, White you Sox had... Scrace, by the way. They are really, really and bad. I'm saying that as someone who... Absolutely loves Andrew Benintendi and the whole Benintendi family. And his grandpa coached me in baseball and is one of my, oh my favorite goodness. people, if not of all time, from Georgetown, Ohio. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I would love for the White Sox to be good because of Andrew. And I feel bad for him because he's struggling and he's hearing it from the fans. But that team is a mess right now. So the Reds went in there and did what they should have done. Um, and, of course, they, they did have the series finale against the Brewers on Wednesday. Um, but, well, not wasn't supposed to be the series finale. Ended right. up being the series finale because of a, a postponed game. Yeah, that will be made up, made up in August, uh, late August at that. But um, we, we got to see a little bit of CES getting out of his slump. We got to see Candelario getting out of his slump. We got to see L.A. De La Cruz on fire yeah. on Fire, um, and then we we got to see uh, Nick Lodolo coming back from his injury. Um, we got to see pretty much everything that you would want to see in that Chicago series. Yeah, and everything, everything, everything you just mentioned um, excites me for the season. Um, Lodolo, for sure. My God, yeah. if he can stay healthy, and and you know he's shown signs of this. When he's healthy, he's really damn good. He's really good. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he was really, really good his first time out the other day. He won't do that every game. They all have stinkers. But that guy, I, he could be really, really good. And if he is, they're going to be right where I thought they'd be. 
for the entire season. Um, it was nice that that David Bell took your suggestion and made some lineup changes in the batting order. And you yes. know what? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think a guy, a veteran like him, does he feel pressure where he's hitting in the lineup? You wouldn't think so. But all I know is when he dropped down the seven, all of a sudden he starts mashing. So – we're talking about Candelario there. Uh, yeah. For those who, who weren't picking up what you were putting down. No, I thought but, I said his name, but I don't know. Um, but yeah, <laughs> Candelario. Yeah. Well, you you made the suggestion. You know, steer now in the four spot, which makes sense, and he's still driving in runs. By the way, he's um, leading the league at, at least at one point this this weekend. He was leading the league. I don't know if the, he still does or not, but yeah, I don't know. But he but he's. Definitely leading the team. I know that. Sure. Uh, but, you know, and, and CES has come alive and, and really looks like, you know, I mean, he looks like a three-hole hitter right now. Uh, you move Benson up, uh, and and he seems to take to that. And, and he's, you know, he can cause some issues on the base pass too, you know. It's just like they're missing some pieces, but what they have behind them – are showing some signs that that uh, they might be able to hold the fort here till till everybody gets back. Um, but Frankie Montas is getting he, he's got to get his stuff straightened out, man. He, he can't do what he did last night and, and the start before. And you know, last night he has that horrible first game, forty five freaking pitches in the first. That's a lot of pitches. You're <laughs> almost done at that point in today's game. Yeah, that's how <laughs> It was so funny. <laughs> the first inning still going on, and Brantley's talking about that. Like, ah, it doesn't matter what he does now. He ain't pitching deep in this game. <laughs> I'll be glad if he gets three innings, let alone five, which, you know, I, I think it was the third when he got knocked out. He came back and, you know, he walked too many guys, obviously, threw 45 pitches, comes back, has a nice second inning, then walks a guy to start the third, gives up a homer, and it's like, you know, that's it. You're done, which he was. Um, but you did get to see Nick. Better. Ever since I put that bet on him, he's gone to hell in a handbasket. It's your fault. Uh, but but we we did get to see Nick Martinez, on the other hand, pitch really well out of the, out of the pen. Which that's is what, the role I want for him. I agree. I agree. Not necessarily pop up, you know, when it's out of reach. But if a guy's struggling early and you still have a chance – you got a guy and do what he did. And and that's, I, I don't know that that would be a nice luxury for the Reds to have if, if he can fill that role. And He's that's going to be up to guys like Frankie Montas, because I don't care how much you've paid Frankie and they paid a lot, 15 million a year or whatever it is, but, and look, it's been two games. We'll see where he is. He, he may carry the load from here on out. We'll see. But at some point, if, if that keeps happening, you can't wait too long to say, you know what, dude, we we can't keep running you out there. And, and there's a guy on the mound tonight that I feel the same way about. Um, he's showing signs, Hunter Green, of coming around, but you can't constantly, you know, be throwing these balls over the middle of the plate and getting them hit for 430 feet. You can't do it. <laughs> well, that's what happened his last time out. It's not good for the back of your baseball card, no. No, he had two pitches right over the middle of the plate just get hammered. I I, I think that you're probably a couple games away from me saying that maybe it's time to move India out of that leadoff role. Um, but he did have – get it. He did have that crazy game where he had, what, th four walks in a game, three walks yeah. in a game. Um, and And – you know I'm a little partial to him. But I don't necessarily think he should be hitting leadoff either. I just think I'm, he's a tough player and he's filling a role now that I'm glad he's here to fill. Even though I, defensively, I get it, I get it, I get it. But in no way, shape, or form, player. I'm not saying he doesn't need to be on this team. I'm not saying he doesn't need to start. I'm not right. saying he doesn't need to be in the field. I'm totally okay with all of those things. All I'm saying is I don't know that he's necessarily this team's answer at the leadoff spot. Um, so I, I do want to see some more hits out of him there. 
Um, but as long as you're getting on base, I guess, and, and again, I know he had all of those uh, walks in, in, a, in a game. I think they said that was his first time in, since his rookie year, having that many walks in a game. Um, yeah, you, you, you got to gotta get on base. No, the name you of the game. And, and also, um, I would say, I mean, cross your fingers. Everything's been positive on Friedel coming back. That'll be his role. So we're looking at two more weeks, maybe three, but I, I think two to three weeks that dude's back is everything. I mean, apparently he's a pretty quick healer. Well, in two to three weeks is plenty of time for a guy like India to also turn things around and to the point where we're not even having that conversation, but instead potentially having a conversation where maybe you have guys yeah. vying for that role, which is I will where say we want to be. Yeah, but I'll tell you, I, I – I'm a big fan of TJ in that leadoff role. I am as well. You, you will, and and outside of that, the two as long as CES is still hitting, then you won't hear me saying a word at, about him in the three spot because I think his power is probably second to none on this team. Um, but if if it doesn't continue, I'd much rather have Steer move up into that three spot and just kind of hang out there for as long as he likes. Um, yeah, that dude, you can put him anywhere, to be honest. But, yeah, he's a good three-hitter. He's been mm-hmm. – I mean, he was a good seven-hitter. I mean, just he, a, he's just a player. And I, I – yep. you know, it, it does seem like – isn't it weird that a guy like that, though, seems like he has to constantly prove himself he, over and over? I, I don't quite get it. I'm not I'm, sure why he was hitting so far down in that lineup to begin with. I'm not sure there's a player on this team that I'm currently more bullish on than Spencer Steer. I get it. I get I mean, from the time he's come up with him, he's shown it. And it doesn't matter where they put him in the field. It just doesn't matter. He just plays. He's he's good. What else we got on the Reds? Anything else? Um, hopefully – they are they are finishing up this series uh, against Seattle before they come home and have a uh, home stand against the Angels this weekend. The Angels are not great currently either, uh, so that's not a bad team to right. get right if you if things go a little wonky with this Seattle series. Um, as I don't, I don't love the pitcher they're going up against tonight, and I don't know who they have tomorrow. No, that kid's good. If uh, if you if you struggle tonight, no, he's then right-handed, but he's good. If if you struggle tonight, then that there goes the series. But right, um, but you do have the the Angels and the Phillies, and those are two teams right now that are also struggling. So uh, this this you got to get the the wins right now where you can outside the division because the division right now is four teams over five hundred. How really, is that and, possible? And and. and and the fifth team is one game under 500. So th- this this division is pure pandemonium and is probably just another thing that's going to get me very upset about the fact that they didn't do more this offseason to just run away with this division. Well, I will also say it's still very early. This is not sure a huge sample for a baseball season. But it is. And the Pirates are starting to come back to earth, it looks like. Um I will say this, and we and we should acknowledge, uh, you know, how Abbott's been pitching and what he did Friday night. I know the Reds scored a boatload of runs, but that dude's a bulldog. You made the Tom Browning uh, yes. reference to him the, the last time we spoke, I believe. Uh, and now every time I see him with his little – he just has that little belly of his that, that hangs over yeah. the belt – and I can't unsee Tom Browning now, be- <laughs> largely, largely, largely because of the the little belly hanging over. There's, that there's, belt. That, there's just little other mannerisms that remind me of that. I, 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 <laughs> uh, I I'll, I'll get myself in trouble here, but, um, you know, I know Abbott comes from a damn good family and all that, but I just wonder if Tom Browning spent a night in Virginia at some point. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, uh, we'll we'll see what these Reds yeah, do. Yeah, on from that. <laughs> it really is 
funny to to see him out there and, and just he's got that same bulldog mentality and and you know works fast not as fast as Suter but my God <laughs> what you, I mean I I'm, I'm gonna have to go back and look or I'm gonna have to ask him or I'll ask his his father in law um, if he always worked that fast I should probably know this if it was always that way before the pitch clock because this dude gets the ball. Well, I don't know that he ever shakes off a catcher either. I think he just throws it. Uh, yeah, I'm not even sure he takes signals from the catcher at this point. <laughs> it's amazing how um, quick he is. It's reminiscent it's a little hilarious. bit of it's it's a little reminiscent of Wade Miley. We we saw Miley do this yes. before, the, before yes. the pitch clock. And, oh and my god, yes. I I think Suter might actually be faster than Wade Miley. And, and those yeah, and that's saying something. And and trust me. Those dudes loved playing behind Wade Miley. They loved it. When it was his turn to pitch, the whole team was fired up because they knew they were going to be standing out there in the outfield, and, you know, hearing someone yell their name. And, the, you know, it was just like, I got to be ready, got to be ready, got to be ready. And, uh, boy, they, they loved playing behind him. And, and Suter, as you said, is, is quicker than that. Two more topics I want to get to before we get out of here for this week. Um, the Bengals have a draft coming up here. It, I can't believe it this quickly. It's it's already upon us. I know. Um, the the NFL draft is is just about here, and the Bengals are currently sitting at eighteen. I don't expect them to move off of eighteen, barring it, it would be the most unBengal like thing if they either traded. Even if they traded back, um, I, I think that would be a little unBengal like for them to try and stockpile later picks. Um, but they, uh, they're, and they, I, for them to trade up from 18 would be wildly out of character. So here they sit at 18. T. Higgins, by all counts, came out this week and said he'll be back as a Bengal and will be playing for a Super Bowl with the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, doing the the PR thing. What do you expect to to do that anyway? I think everybody did, but I I think then you had dude, he's going to make what 20 and a half or 21 and a half. Um, Yeah. And I get wanting the big, you know, guaranteed deal. Of course you want that. But this collective bargaining agreement has been pretty good for the players for the most part. A lot of guys have made out. They they took so back at way back when there would be guys, let's say like Achilles Smith drafted by the Bengals. And, and they had that salary structure. And that guy would get a lot of guaranteed money. And you had veterans who had produced and were damn good, but the system was set up where they didn't necessarily get that money. And it's set up now where these veterans that prove their worth will make that money for the year they are playing. And he's going to make the money he is worth for the year he's going to play. And I I just think he's a good guy anyway. I think he's a gamer. I think he's a dude that wants to go out there and win and love success. And so I didn't see this as being a monumental problem that he was going to turn into this head case. Now, I could be proven wrong. I, I have been. I've missed on some of these. But I don't see that happening. I think he sees an opportunity to go out and have a hell of a year with a hopefully healthy Joe Burrow. And and Zach talked about that and everything's on schedule. You know, you, you got Jamar on the other side. I mean, he's got a chance to have a hell of a year going into where he's a free agent if he's not tagged again and and, and maybe get a ring. So I, I I was not shocked by that, and and I'm glad he sees it that way. I think that's the right way to see it, and I think he's going to make the most of what he has, and and that's that's the mark of a good teammate, a good player, and you know a good human being. And I, I'm I'm glad to hear that. I I think, and now they're set up, they have all of that. They're set up going into this draft where they can take whatever they want. And so unless someone bowls them over and and maybe they will move back if somebody, I I don't think anyone's going to bowl them over for 18, but, mm -hmm. but 
whatever the hell they want here. And I love it. They don't have to reach for someone. They don't have to, I, I mean, you know, they, they can go offensive linemen. They can go defensive linemen. They can go corner. They can go whatever the hell they want. So at 18, George Vogel, you're on the clock. Who are you hoping, above any other name, is there at 18, realistically? Oh, my God. Any of the – any of the top offensive linemen, they and, and I know they have their tackles maybe, but give me give me the kid from Alabama, Latham. Give me you, you know what though? I would even take the defensive lineman from Texas too. That's who I want, Byron Murphy. Yeah, I would take him. That's but who I that, want. That's the beauty of this position. And, and the reason I give a slight edge for Latham or one of the other tackles, a kid from, is it Oregon State? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, these guys can always move inside and give competition to where, you know, where you would like to see some competition there at the guard position. Um but I, I, I err on the side of the offensive line because you've got Joe Burrow back there and you've got to keep him upright and you've got to keep him healthy um, because God bless Jake Browning and all they did last year. But, but I mean, that's, you know, that's a guy that makes it happen. And I'm just uh, – I saw too many nightmares on these Bengals teams not having enough offensive linemen where it got them in deep, deep trouble. and when you can't keep a quarterback from getting sacked and you can't run the football, you can't do squat, you get killed. Um, so I, I would, I would shade my wishes towards the offensive line, but I'd be happy. Either line is my priority. Not super high on another tackle from Alabama. I have seen two tackles on this team over the course of the last decade or so in Andre Smith and um, and most recently Jonah Williams and I'm I'm all the way out on Nick Saban Alabama tackles <laughs> I understand that I do understand that so so the guy from Oregon State which I don't know can he play Latu yeah is that his name, Latu? No, no. Oh, my God. You're going to ask me to say this. Talese Fuaga? Uh, okay. Fuaga? I didn't know if it was Fuaga, Latu, or... I don't know. Fa I, I, fa I knew fa last... Fa Fautanu. I, I, knew, I, I knew last week I was better prepared for the draft last week. Don't ask me why, because I'm freaking one week out from the draft now. Pretty sure all of those guys are in the bloodline. <laughs> What's that? That's a that's a WWE reference for those of you who aren't following oh. along. I, I was there with you, Chad. Well done. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I want I want Byron Murphy there. Uh, the the Bengals have not drafted a defensive tackle in a long time, and uh, I, I think that that's where I'd like them to go and have a guy there at that position for probably a, a good long while yeah you can't go wrong there as long as that guy's you know a fit and gets on the field and does but look i it to me football is a line driven guy uh, game really i mean those guys don't get any uh, some of them get notoriety but um it's that's where it starts it would be interesting, though, to see the Bengals do something wild and crazy, like selecting a Brian Thomas at that spot and then consequentially trade T. Higgins thereafter. Uh, but, again, that would be very un -Bengal like It would be un -Bengal like but I get where you're coming from there. But I would rather – I mean, hell, if it gets to that, you know what I'd do? What would you do, George? Draft Brock Bowers. Well, if he's there, <laughs> if he's there, well, I, I'll tell you what, that, that would be a jolt. It would be fine. I, I don't know. I mean, 
I, I don't know. Is that kid going to be a surefire stud in the NFL? He sure looks like it. I don't. I, I'm I'm seeing nothing to say that the Bengals would know how to use a tight end any better than Arthur Smith used Kyle Pitts down in Atlanta. So yeah, that's true. We'll see. Had a chance at Michael Mayer last year too. Yep, and so he didn't do anything out in Oakland either. But I'll tell you what, he probably did more than what the Bengals' first round pick did. But probably did more than what the Bengals have done with the tight end in quite some time as well. So who knows? Um, Switching subjects here. uh, FC Cincinnati loses another one. Can't score. They can't score. What what is this team? I'm I'm seeing things on Twitter. I don't follow this team closely enough to be able to speak to this. Maybe you can, George. But I'm seeing that every position – I saw somebody tweet this out. Um, Every position that they – made a move this off season. They actually got worse. Do you believe that to be the case? It, it feels like that's the case. Yeah. I, I, I know what they're saying. Um, and that's disappointing because this front office has done a, a pretty damn good job the past couple of years. Mm-hmm. And there's been some whiffs and yeah, I, I get what they're saying. Um, and, and the proof is in the results and you're seeing what they've scored eight goals in eight games in MLS play. I believe that's that's not enough to win games. No, that you're you're going to get. It'll be like last year, where okay, you know they had a great year, they won a lot of matches, but when they got in the playoffs and push came to shove, teams just had more firepower, and and they were a better offensive club last year. So. It's a problem. Um, I still have faith that Pat Noonan and and company, they'll figure it out, Chris Albright, the GM. But I don't know. It, it's 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 a head scratcher that yes, they did they did get worse. Um, and they knew what they were up against and they knew what they were losing. Um, but we'll see. It's still relatively early. Um, you know, you're eight, eight games in nine coming up this week down in Atlanta. Um, I don't know. It's disappointing. It's very disappointing to see the start they're off to, even though they're still, they're not buried in the standings or anything like that. Um, but it, it doesn't feel good. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta win games. You can't just draw and lose. It's not a, not a good way to sneak into the playoffs if you have no, any chance when of the surviving. Other team scores a goal, you're in trouble. Yeah, that's whether it's good. in the first minute, you know, not you a good know place to be. Right. Um yeah. any any local high school news from George Vogel? No, nothing. I've, all I've been doing is kind of keeping an eye on uh you know the young basketball player for sale Marion and kind of anticipating what's going on there because uh, that would be a big, big, big deal if she decides to stay home and play basketball. Yeah, if she decides to pull the trigger and commit to Cincinnati, she would be the highest. Interesting to see. I mean, I would love to see that. I would would love to see some buzz. Um, You know, I mean, that would probably – I mean, Cheryl Cook was the all-time great. She committed when I was still at UC from Indianapolis. And it, it was amazing. And back then, I mean, you know, women's basketball, not in its infancy, but it wasn't where it was today. But that was a big deal. It was kind of a shocker. She'd and, be the highest ranked player to ever commit to Cincinnati. Yeah, and she, in, and, and in any the sport they've ever had. And they've had in, some good ones. In any sport, she'd be the highest yeah. ranked player. Yeah, it, it was amazing. It's like, huh? <laughs> and then you see her play, and it's like she was so far ahead of her time. I mean, really, it was, you know, 20 some years after the big O came here from Indianapolis. And and it's like, yeah, it's, it's interesting that, you know, the two top ranked players and God, I'll get myself in trouble here with Kenyon Martin, but, um, you know, the big O was the big O. And then, you know, 20 some years later, you got Cheryl Cook and both from the Indianapolis area 
committing to UC is, is, is kind of interesting. That, that that's I wanna, where the best players came from. I want to go back and clarify my comment about the highest ranked player. I was talking about D. Alexander. If she commits, she would be the highest ranked player. Yeah, higher in, sure. Yes, high, highest ranked player in any sport that that would have committed to Cincinnati. So. Um, We'll see. It could be a, an interesting week. Yeah, because honestly, Ken, Kenyon was under the radar. Like, yeah. you know, he was definitely – I remember when they were recruiting him and one of the assistants told me, they are like, we got this kid in Texas that I'm telling you is going to be so good. And it's like there wasn't a whole lot of buzz, and they got him. And, you know, then they got him in here. And, it, well, you won't remember. Is that um, I can't remember what the what what the deal was, but he wasn't eligible for the first semester or the first part of the season, and then they were able to somehow there was some way they did this where he either didn't take classes and retook the the SAT. There was something they did, and then at the break he was eligible and was not a superstar by any stretch. Very 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 raw. And you give Kenyon Martin so much credit for how much better he got. And the staff and Bob Huggins pushing him along. And by the time that kid was a junior, he was a monster. And I did not see that coming because he improved his shot. He became a good free throw shooter. He got fouled all the time because he was constantly doing stuff under the bug. It, it was just, wow, watching that happen. And then I go back to that assistant telling me, we think this kid's going to be great. It's like, who? What? You know, he came in and, and he couldn't make a free throw. He didn't look like he'd ever shot a ball before. By the time he was a junior, <laughs> he was a damn stud. Oh, and then, well, God, that brings back bad memories now. I think wow, that's such that's a shit. That's going to be the note that we end this podcast on. So, hung a banner, damn it! Way, way to go! Way, way to bring everybody's hung mood. A banner. Way to bring everybody's mood down, George. No, um, look, they just got a great recruit today in the portal. They got a good one yesterday. Um, they're on the up, call, baby. They're on the call, up. That's what we call bookending it in the bids. Uh, that's going to wrap it up for George in the Jungle. Um, again, check out Remington Tavern. They sponsor us. We appreciate them at yes, 8892 Glendale Milford Road, 45140, where you can check out their daily happy hour from 3 to 7 p.m. Their $5 bourbon whiskey Wednesdays, bottle cap bonanza on Thursdays from 7 to 9 p.m. Check them out on Instagram at Remy Tav Cincy or follow them on Facebook. But for George Vogel, I'm Aaron Smith. And we will catch you on this same channel, 9 o'clock next Tuesday.